Our dear Swami Lord, we greet our Savior. The fullness of time he comes to earth to redeem mankind. And we light our song with the song of all the angels of heaven as we greet him here present. So Dominus Fabius Cum Initium Sancti Evangelii Cum Domino the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was made nothing that has been made. And the Word was made flesh, and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and of truth. In the Holy Land, one sees on the ground this verse, et verbum caro factum est, but in the middle is the extra word hic, here. It's there in Nazareth. And if our memory is correct, it's also there in Bethlehem. Let us go to the place of which we have just read. We know that when there's a strong tradition for which generations and actually different rites have fought, then the chances are that we're handling the reality. Therefore, it's there. And one sort of feels it actually. It's underground, especially in Bethlehem. And it's essentially a grotto, very small. The form of it is, as it were, a small chapel at which the altar 
at the end where the actual incarnation took place is in the hands of the Greeks and then we have the Latin rite part which is the lateral altar there it's actually a kind of L thing almost tucked away the altar is there and there is the manger and it's probably true there's no smoke without fire and every Thursday there's a fully sung mass entirely in Latin with incense sung with all the Christians that can get in there and helped by the nuns that we were staying with Brigitteans with regard to the beauty of the singing. Only three priests could get in there. It used to be priest, deacon and subdeacon, now it's three concelebrants who have to know Latin. And I was there and I had that all booked and when they saw that there was a pilgrim coming from afar, I was quite moved because one of them said, oh let him have my place. So I was able to be the third and it's very moving. As one gets to the words of consecration, one senses almost something coming down one's spine. The incarnation is taking a place again exactly where it happened 2,000 years ago, in our hands. Now, some years ago, I picked up something which would be questioned and it was pointed out to me that it wasn't safe but I'm going to repeat it because it's so badly done that actually I think the weight of evidence would be that it's therefore true because if one wants to fake something one does it properly it was this a fairly young, I believe American pilgrim was taking bits of video as he was going into that land which is under Palestine and he was showing how difficult it was to get in there from Israel and then as he was in prayer in that grotto he discarded completely his camera, his video he didn't think he was on at all but out of some distraction or something else it was actually filming where he put it and it was filming where he was praying, it was filming the grotto, the part where actually the Lord came, the Greek part. And at a certain point, without anyone doing a thing, there appeared on the video for a few seconds, but quite visibly, the form of a perfect child, just under the altar, just where the incarnation took place, and this is the puzzling bit, he had his hands, which would be impossible normally, extended like this, because a child couldn't do that, but the explanation I thought about it afterwards would be this, it's exactly what would happen if our blessed lady was holding up his hands for the shepherds the kings to come and honour her divine child. You can see it for yourself. Who cares if it's true or not? It's the point that actually the Lord was there. And we're handling there history and fact. In fact, the one who made history and fact. It's the point where all knowledge meets our limited knowledge. It's heaven and earth, time and eternity intersecting in our geography and time. This is an explosion. As will be 33 years later, not that far away in Jerusalem, what now is being investigated anew. What actually happened at the explosion which ended it all and began it all on the other holy night? They're going now into actually the nature of that explosion. We'll handle that in a few months' time when we come to preach on Easter. But it's the same force. Now, every
Every time one celebrates the sacred mysteries, especially actually in a quiet celebration where there's no distraction, one is aware that actually the same thing is right there happening. And have you noticed that the more quiet and interiorized the celebration is, the more one picks up? I am sure that much grace did not get through to the souls of men this night because it was deflected, because the praise was not that of Jesus Christ but that of man. He hates noise and favours greatly the quiet, receptive mode of the Blessed Virgin who treasured all these things in her heart and did not, I am sure, have a lot to say. I've told you this story before, but not all of you, and I think it's worth saying it again, for two reasons. I've thought during this holy night quite a lot about my brethren in the monastic world, specifically actually in the large world Benedictine family. Two, one, the strong French one, and then also the English one. I want to mention, first of all, the French one, because I had a lot to do with them. They actually taught me how to celebrate properly in the old rite at Fon And there, <coughs> Fon and all the filial, the daughter houses of that great mother house, which is itself the daughter house of Solem, but more conservative, because they've kept the old rite. All those houses would have had this night a night of uninterrupted prayer. It has to be so because in practice they don't have concelebration. Each priest celebrates three times. Vespers is pontifical with the abbot with his mitre and very long. Matins is extremely long. Hours. All the responses, all the twelve lessons fully sung. And then each priest celebrates three times. In addition, as well as the midnight mass, very long, in which the abbot pontificates as a bishop, very long, they have also, as we had actually in Sant'Antimo, the dawn mass fully sung, as well, long, and also, after all the offices, lords, prime, terse, the high mass at 11 o'clock, very long and pontifical. So uninterrupted prayer practically from Vespers until that's over. And that actually links us to something hugely powerful. The praying church of the East, where these uninterrupted nights are actually quite frequent on Mount Athos. Uninterrupted, the angels of the earth keeping vigil with the angels of heaven and holding up the world. Actually, yesterday I was talking to a friend of mine who was going to spend this night all in adoration. There are places where it can be done in the area and he was going to do it. And I thought, that's interesting, because without knowing it, he's doing that very thing in his own mode, and making reparation. But I also want to come into this question of the three individual celebrations. Nowadays, we're encouraged to celebrate the three separately, and I've done so on at midnight, one with the old people in the nursing home, which is a dawn one, and one here. They're three separate ones, and it's quite powerful. One sees the progression. But I want to just go back in history to what happened in a place I know in England. It was what happened when a newly ordained priest went on retreat to a monastery, one of the big ones in England, and asked the sacristan if he could celebrate. He'd just been ordained. The sacristan was a bit ruffled because all the altars practically were taken, but he got at the last minute a chalice for him and found an altar which he could use, and left him to it. The priest went to his altar and started. At 
a certain point he heard noises, as though it were a huge mob. It got louder and louder and louder and louder. But he couldn't stop. One can't stop after making the sign of the cross at the beginning. Eventually, it got to a crescendo, and at the annual stay, silence. He concluded and began the other two and retired. The next morning, the monk sacristan asked him how he got on, and he said, but the sacristan actually was not surprised because he added this. Well, actually, I didn't have time to tell you the story behind that chalice. It was very small, you noticed. It's the persecution chalice. We have it from when our brethren were under persecution. Remember, these old houses go right back to pre-reformation times and the past to terror of times in France. So, this was being used on Christmas night, in secret, in Paris, in prison, by a person on death row, or at least threatened with it. And at that time, they were taking quite violently one of his co-prisoners to be hanged, or rather guillotined it was in France, the guillotine was the means, guillotined outside in the court of the prison. And at the moment of the annual day, he was guillotined. And the sacristan quietly added, that priest had just been ordained, and it was his first Christmas Mass. And they say that every time a priest just ordained celebrates his first Christmas Mass with this chalice, he hears it. The good Benedictine who told us the story, we were all around him, young men, actually in Ealing Abbey at the time, he looked towards us, particularly towards me actually, with a twinkle in his eye and said this, I haven't yet found anyone who could actually verify whether it was true. Alas, I couldn't get back to downside after ordination, under obedience, I had to minister in Rome, so I will never know whether it happened still. But I bet you, it does. For God does not change or get old, and is a God of great surprises. Spirit to to
sad. Now let me show you something else. This is what happened the other day in Bethlehem. Now look, it might help you to remember that what you cannot see is nevertheless there. And we can see all that is happening at the altar before your blind, blind eyes. Now look. 